going to talk about air pollution. And actually, how many of you are teachers? Not many, but I hope that you still enjoy our lesson for Lisa because um, air pollution is a problem that everyone should be aware of, right? And before I would like to talk about my uh, lesson plan design, do you think that um, air pollution is necessarily to be taught in our school curriculum? What do you think? Yes. yes. Okay, most of you say yes, but why? Why? You say yes, but can I know it? Because the next generation is going to have to deal with that more so than anyone before that. Yeah, it's going to be something that they can't ignore, they can't wait to solve. So it'll be up to them to help fix that problem in the future. Okay, it is about our next generation. Okay. Okay, what else? Do you have any other reasons why we have to talk about air pollution? We can have different topics in our curriculum, but why we should include air pollution in our curriculum? Do you think it is a serious problem in Hong Kong? Yes. Yeah. Why? I always want to like to ask why. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, because actually we are breathing every day, right? If the air is not good enough, then um, our health will be uh, affected. So, if you think that it is a serious problem, how can you show to your students that it is a serious problem? Actually, we cannot see the air pollution, right? Or, okay, maybe so, yeah. So, maybe. It's like Okay, and actually that's what I want to talk about because I think while we are going to start this lesson, um, we have to know that uh, this problem is serious, but it is not a subjective tool. Actually, we can assess the air pollution objectively. So, ABI is a very uh, useful tool for students to know how to measure our quality of air that we are breathing every day. And actually, this table can be found in the um, EPD, Environmental Protection Department website. And the air pollution can actually be classified into different levels. And they have their relative potential health implications, which can um, make the students know that actually they are really affected by air pollution. So they need to know how to solve this kind of problem. Before solving problem, I think we need to know the cause of the air pollution in Hong Kong. What do you think? What is the main reasons of the air pollution? The main cause, the fundamental cause of the air pollution in Hong Kong? Power plants. Power plants, yes. Traffic. traffic. Marine traffic. Tankers and cargo ships. Yes, marine traffic. I think mostly, actually, from the uh, vehicles, actually, that you have already mentioned. But how can we deal with this problem? If you are just like me, I'm just a citizen in Hong Kong, how can I deal with this problem? I know it is very serious, but what can I do? What do you think? Where we teach them this problem, but we didn't, <laughs> we didn't offer them any solution. Then they just know it, and they don't know how to deal with it. So what do you think? What can you do? Alternative modes of transportation. Sorry? Educating on alternative modes of transportation, so walking somewhere or... Uh, the methods that we can use, and also maybe we can make use of what we have learned in the session one, that we can grow some plants, right? That is what we can do. Um, while teaching the students about the uh, uh, vehicle's problem, we can, also, we can also mention this labels. Do you know what this label, labels stand for? What? <laughs> LPG. LPG. So, what is LPG? We provide petroleum gas. Thank you. <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> Actually, it is a thing that is very environmentally friendly while uh, comparing with the uh, typical food that we are using in Hong Kong. So, we can teach the students to observe while they are, you know, Pressing the rows, they can find these labels, which means that um, the taxi or the minibus are using the fuel that are more environmentally friendly, so that they can have more observation in their daily lives. And then for the government part, 
we know what we can do, and actually, being a responsible citizen, we can also give suggestions to our government, right? So we can let the students to think about actually what the government can do and what the government is doing. So, have you uh, heard of this monitoring network before? So it is not very, <laughs> but uh, actually it is what our government is doing. Uh, Hong Kong government and also the Guangdong provincial government, they are having this monitoring network in the Pearl River Delta Regional Air Quality. So um, for this one, the purpose is to make sure the air pollutants will not be exceeded and to make sure that the pollutants from the mainland China, because you know the development of mainland China, right? They will also have some pollutants that will you know, go to Hong Kong. So this is a very useful monitoring network between governments, okay? Which means that our government is doing something and collaborating with the China, mainland China as well. So actually what the questions that I have asked is what I want to include in my lesson plan. Um, first of all, if they want to know air pollution, they need to know the reasons. They need to know how this air pollution affects their daily lives. And then API, uh, the air pollution index, is a very useful tool for them to um, evaluate the efficiency of government policy. Because for example, if government uh, starts to launch a new policy, okay, you can see the API uh, changes in that period. Okay, so they have to learn the APIs as well. And then for the last part, for the last part, actually they are not only talking about um, the knowledge uh, issue. We also have to know what we can do as a responsible citizen. So, and also I like to suggest some uh, pedagogies <coughs> such as role play or case study. They can imagine if they were the investors, will they be willing to open the company in Hong Kong? <coughs> Actually, it can help to enhance their critical <coughs> thinking because you know opening a company is not a very simple thing. They have to analyze and to see from different perspectives, and also from the tourism um, perspective as well. And also have some news discussion, which is. We, we can talk about some news that is unique in Hong Kong. For example, like the war event. Have you heard of it before? No? <coughs> then if you heard of it, do you know what is this? Actually, it is about the tall buildings because you know that in Hong Kong, we don't have enough land for residential use. So our buildings are built in a taller and taller way. And actually, it may block some air pollutants within a specific area which worsen the air pollution. Yes, so you can talk about this news and also um, ask them, should we ban all the construction of these kinds of tall buildings? What do you think? Do you think we can ban all these tall buildings? Yes or no? Yes or no? No. 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 How and how, okay. So maybe the students can understand that actually we don't have any absolute answer for all the uh, questions, but we can learn how to strike a balance between development and also how to protect our environment. Okay, and that's my part, and I will now have Anisha to talk about her lesson plan as well. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention too that if you're not a teacher but you have kids at home, there are a few activities here that you could even try with your own kids at home that would be very home friendly and you don't have to do it in this school. So basically the first lesson that I came up with is to do with this idea of air pollution and we do think it's quite important that students and children know the reason, one of the reasons why we plant, um, where we plant plants and grow gardens, is to reduce the air pollution. So the lesson plans that I designed can be used with the Hong Kong curriculum or a 
um, international curriculums, as long as you have the theme of environmental education in your curriculum. These are just some curriculum outcomes. This is one from Canada. I'm from Canada. I use the Alberta curriculum. So for the first part, you're going to ask students what air pollution means. Um, see, if they, see if they know what it means. Um, you can ask them what causes it. And then you can record their answers in a Wordle. How many of you, is, you have used Wordle before? Have you, a few. I'll see if this works. So basically it's a program, a software program, where you can, um, you can type words. You type words into a nice format, and you can change the font, change uh, the color. This doesn't seem to be working. But it's, in, it's embedded in here, so you can check it out later. And it's just kind of fun for the kids to see could be a form of art. Then you're going to tell the students that they're going to learn what air pollution is if they, they don't already know, and how it affects people, and what we can do to help. And I found this book. If you need a book, more information on air pollution, it's uh, by Rhonda Lucas Donald. It goes in depth into the topic of air pollution, the causes. So you can read that to them. And then they're actually going to design a brochure. So with the information that they got from the book, they're going to come up with three of the causes of air pollution and three ways people can reduce air pollution. And they'll have a title page and an explanation of what air pollution is. So you're going to tell the students, you're going to lie to them, and you're going to say that the EPA wants to see these things on their brochure. And they're going to be kind of like a designer, so they're going to design this whole brochure. And I made some templates for the teachers, if you want them, because I know for my own students, when I'm doing a project, sometimes they need a rough copy. So I have rough copy templates. They can figure out what information they want to put on their brochure, figure out how to organize it, and make their rough copy, and then do a good copy. I'm really picky. I like everything to look beautiful, so I like the, the good copy. If you need an assessment, I came up with an assessment as well. Um, this could be integrated with maybe language arts or science even, so you can figure out how you want to use this. Tweak it even, I'll send you uh, the Word document. And then this is uh, an idea that I found in a book. So basically to show students that there is indeed pollution in the air, you can get some Vaseline. I got this tube of the squeezable kind. And then you can take plates and design, make little designs on the plates. I put sad smiley faces because none of us like air pollution. And put one of the plates outside, um, maybe someplace high. It was on my balcony on the 35th floor. And then the other one stays inside to compare. And just leave them out for a few days, and you'll see that the particulates kind of get caught in there, and the color changes. And you can tell the kids, this is what we breathe, and it's pretty disgusting. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. Kim Abellis is an artist that I, I found. I was really inspired by the work that she does. She works with smog art. She's from California, and she did this whole exhibit of plates. And she had um, she put stencils on the plates, and then she left the plates out on roofs, and then the designs were then on the plates from the particulates in the air. I'm just going to quickly show you some of her work. I thought it was really interesting. I'm showing you the presidential smog plates. These are um, <laughs> presidents on the plates, and my favorite one. It was Ronald Reagan. And so what she did was she came up with a quote for each of these presidents. Um, and the presidents that did more damage to the environment were left out longer on the to collect, where is he, to 
to collect the particulate. I don't know where he is. But anyways, I'm just going to share the quote that I really liked on the plate. And it is... Uh, Ronald Reagan in 1980 said, approximately 80% of our air pollution stems from hydrocarbons released by vegetation. So let's not go overboard in setting and enforcing tough emission standards from man-made sources. Yeah, really bad. This was my own little stencil art that I tried. I put some cling wrap on top and then cut out a design. But unfortunately, my plate got rained on, and so it sort of destroyed whatever the particulates may have gone on there. If you want to try this um, in art class with your students, there's an actual lesson plan based on Kim Abellis's work on the, the plates. The small collectors is what they're called. And so this kind of goes through, oh, there's the Ronald Reagan plate. This goes through the steps involved um, in creating that type of work. Probably this would be better to do with older students, but you could do it as a, an, an example with them for younger ones. Uh, this was a clip I found on YouTube about Kim Abellis discussing her work. She goes into schools and she works with students to uh, create various types of environmental art, and she talks about uh, the process of working with students and kind of how to do that and and more about her art. I, I found that very interesting. Some resources for air pollution. This one I think is really cool. It's a free iPad app. Um, I kind of thought it would be neat if you could take that iPad app and then monitor the API um, of the air over maybe a week or a month or a certain period of time. And then you can integrate that into math and create bar graphs or ways of charting that information. There's a lot of software online that you could use with the students. Oh, another lesson plan idea I had was another book that I found. It's called Look What I Did With a Leaf. And basically the author talks about how you can create um, animals out of leaves. <laughs> And so you can take your students on a nature walk, collect leaves, talk about the shape of the animals, and they can collect leaves for animals. Um, these are some nature art gardening type websites for your rooftop garden or gardening you can look at. I found a number of books from just the public library here in Hong Kong that I thought would be really good to use with kids. There is an actual resource for green roof schools. It's this book. Um, it has information about the program and other, other information that's good for that. Eco art. And this is all on the list. Um, two of my favorites are Keeping a Nature Journal. I think this would be excellent for green roof schools or any schools working with plants. Um, it gives, the author is Claire Walker Leslie, and she's actually, this is her forte, is creating nature journals. She goes into detail about how to, how to create art from nature. She talks about things like contour drawings, shading, um, mixing paint, these kinds of things, and observing nature. So this is a really comprehensive resource. And then she does a more kid-friendly version, which is the Nature Connection. So this would be probably good to use with young students or younger kids. And this one actually has uh, templates in it where they can draw. If you wanted to do this with your son or daughter, you could use this type of book with them. And then online, she has some reproducible, reproducible forms as well. Eco-friendly crafting. Lots of neat ideas. You can look at my books later if you like. And uh, good earth art. This one, I think, won an award. Maybe, oh, maybe. And green crafts for children.
but not least. So I'm looking at food systems. Um, my name's Emma, first of all. I teach secondary school. And I just want to start off with a short story about a class I taught. Um, it was actually teaching, doing a replication of Dragon's Den. Have any of you seen this show? Okay, so there, it's, it's just um, a show where people are coming and demonstrating their businesses and then there's a panel and they can choose to invest in the business or not. And so one of the examples I showed them was this company called Ten Trees and their model was selling clothing and for each article of clothing that they sold, they would plant ten trees. And so we were talking about it as a business. And I asked them, so who would buy this article of clothing? Who, like, does it mean something to you? Do you want 10 trees to be planted? And two out of 15 students raised their hands. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was really meaningful. And I thought it just emphasized the fact that um, environmental education is really important. And it's important for us to know about. And it's really important for us to share this knowledge with the next generation. Because in order for them to make a change, they need to know about the problem first and what they can do. And so my focus is on food systems. It's looking at, there's four components, um, supply chain. So what our food actually goes through, the steps it goes through for us to be able to eat it. And then the environmental impacts that that food supply system creates. And then we're going to look specifically at meat as a food supply chain, and then look at ways that we can reduce our impact, environmental impact through the foods that we eat. Um, so I got most of my resources from this website here, and it was developed by Harvard, and it's really excellent. So they have a lot of resources and a lot of lesson plans, and all focused on environmental education. So if any of you are teachers and want to check it out, then it's a good one to look at. So I'm going to start with looking at, so the first one is where our food comes from. So, so the first question, what is, are some of your favorite foods? Mango. Mangoes, and what else? Chocolate. Peanut butter. Chocolate, okay. Chocolate's an interesting one because we we'll talk about it later. Okay, so mangoes. So where do you buy mangoes? From a stand. A stand in Hong Kong? Here. You're in Thailand still. So. <laughs> From the supermarket, okay. And how does that mango get to the supermarket? Okay, a truck. Where does the truck come from? From a port. Okay, so maybe it's shipped. Okay, or what else? How else could it get to the grocery store? Truck, and then I mean, in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, it's probably, there's a good chance maybe it's flown over or shipped over. And then where would it go from there? Like, how did it get into this plane or a ship? A port somewhere in Southeast Asia. Okay, a port. And how did it get there? Farm. A truck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another truck. And where did it come from? From the truck? Where, from a farm, ultimately? Growing mangoes? Or a greenhouse? Okay, so you can start to see where the different steps that are involved in buying this mango and all the different processes it goes through. So this is the first lesson and you can do it if you are a teacher, you can do this with your students and have them pick a food and research it um, on a computer and go through these steps and create this chart. So. Yeah, that's the lesson. And so then the next one, I'm not going to show you the video, but it's looking specifically at chocolate. So someone mentioned chocolate being their favorite food and how that's produced. And since I'm not going to look specifically at it, we'll just uh, use these same questions with our mangoes. So uh, where do mangoes, or where are mangoes typically grown? Uh, tropical areas. Tropical areas, sure. All right, and what kind of climate, well we said climate, tropical, so wet, hot. Um, and what other plants and animals might live nearby, do you think? Butterflies. Butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe different insects. All right. Um, and why is it important to think about this? Like where the food is grown, what kind of climate, and 
environment that it's in. Why might that be important? You got to take your food for granted. Mm -hmm. So those animals don't, they're not affected. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. Yeah, just thinking about how they all function together as well, right? So then thinking about if we are seeing some environmental impacts from uh, pollution and whatnot, what would happen to these mangoes if there's too much rain, or there's too little rain, or the groundwater gets polluted? So these are all things that are happening or could happen to our food supply. And so it's just, yeah, good thing to think about, have the children think about. And the next one we're going to be talking about is hamburgers. So who has ever eaten a hamburger from McDonald's? <laughs> Alright, is everyone telling the truth? I don't see that many hands. <laughs> ever, ever eaten a hamburger from McDonald's. Okay. Um, so just thinking about this food chain process that we talked about earlier, thinking about the different steps. So just think about it, like what steps it, we need to go through to get this hamburger from McDonald's. And then think about what kind of impact this process might have on the environment. So what do you think? You can also, I mean, you can bring it back to the mango as well. What kind of impact are we having on the environment in these food supply chains? Is it new beef? <laughs> Deforestation. <laughs> Deforestation, okay. Cutting down trees to provide the land for the beef to get the food. Yep, definitely. The um, emissions from the manure from the beef okay. creates pollution, mm -hmm. air pollution. Yeah, for sure. Great. Anything else? a lot of the same things that mass production brings about mm -hmm. to the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other forms of pollution that we're creating that you can think of? You're polluting your body. Polluting your body, yep. <laughs> yeah, How about... The actual ingredients inside those hamburgers. Yep. We are actually eating. Okay, so those are pollutants in themselves. The packaging. Yeah, sure. Packaging. Mm -hmm. um, Transport, exactly, yeah. All the transport that's involved in shipping this food all around the world. Great. Good answers. So, I have a video for you, and it's a little bit heavy, so, but I do think it's important to know about, and um, I just want to start by saying I, I was a vegetarian for a while, I'm currently not. So I'm not trying to advocate vegetarianism, um, but I do think it's... The video does a good job of it. Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to kind of, yeah. Um, but I do think it's important to think about the impacts and think about what we're eating and how that affects the environment. So we'll watch some of it. So this is... Um, it's taking a really heavy issue and kind of trying to make it into something a little more user-friendly. Actually, I didn't check the sound. Okay, the sound works. Oh, it does. <laughs> Century, greedy agriculture corporations 
began modifying sustainable family farming to maximize their profits at great cost to both humans and animals. Factory farming was born. Animals are packed as closely together as possible. Most never see sunlight, touch ground, or get fresh air. Many can't even turn around. These cruel conditions cause fights and disease amongst the animals. To fix this, the corporate machine began systematic mutilations. Practices such as eating chickens. And they started adding a constant dosage of antibiotics to their feed just to keep these poor wretches alive. This overuse of antibiotics breeds super strains of resistant disease causing germs. Every day we get closer to an epidemic that cannot be stopped. Ew, what's that smell? 12 million pounds of excrement. <laughs> this pollutes the air and groundwater. That's why communities near factory farms often suffer from high levels of related sicknesses. Well, it smells like shh. <laughs> and once more, factory farming corporations have been destroying communities and mistreating their workers for decades. Since 1950, over 2 million small log farms have disappeared. If they continue at this rate, there'll be no real independent family farms left. That is the matrix, Leon. The lie we tell ourselves about where our food comes from. Okay. So, a little heavy, but I was weird debating whether or not to show the whole video, but if if we don't know about it, how can we... Too heavy? <laughs> that was okay. But yeah, if we don't know about it, but and aren't comfortable talking about it, then how are we, we going to educate um, our the next generation? So I'm just for time saving, I'm not going to go through this, but they also have an interactive site where it goes through the process of from the farm through into the factory farm, and it's really lovely because you can click on the, um, I'll just open it really quickly, it, you can click on the different sections and it'll show you like what what's going on and um, has different links to show you about each of these different environmental impacts. So you can browse later, your leisure. Um, and so this lesson is just looking at, uh, we've answered some of these questions already, but what resources are required, where do they come from, and how this food supply chain affects our climate and our water system and sort of the environmental impacts that it has. And so the last section is what we can do to help, uh, help reduce our environmental impact. So what do you think? How can we do that? How can we eat in ways to help reduce environmental impact? Yep. Like for people who are meat eaters, meatless methods. Mm -hmm. like exactly. Food. So instead of completely cutting out meat, even just reducing the amount of meat. Great. Do you have one, Keith? I'm going to say the same thing. Just reduce okay. the amount of meat they eat within a day. So maybe it's sure. every meal having meat. They just have one meal a day. Yep. That's the meat that. Yep. Great. Anything else? Anything local. Eat yeah, locally. <coughs> exactly. Locally. Yep. Organically. Organically, sure. Yep. Yeah, definitely. And how? what does it mean to eat sustainably? Well, this this word's used a lot, but does anybody know what that means? In season. Okay. In season. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. Those labor-intensive yes. foods, you know, yeah. rice. May or may not be the best thing. Okay. Um, you know, it failed in California because it was too labor and water right. intensive. Okay, interesting. Um, you yeah. know, eat, again, eating locally is part of sustainability. Mm -hmm. Yep, definitely. All right. So we've come up with some good ones here. And why is it challenging in Hong Kong? Why is it challenging to There's eat sustainably no here? Right. Yeah. So it's really difficult. I've been finding it's really difficult to find local food. So that is a great back. Bring it back. Yeah. There's a yeah. lot more farms than there was five years ago. Well, that's what. So the aim of this lesson is um, tying in with Edmund's part and set, kind of looking at why it's important to have these ur urban farms. And so exactly, I think what he does is really important. So it is. It is starting to come back. There is a farmers market right in Central every Sunday. So East Island Market. Island. Yeah. yeah. Great. Fun in Stanley, Discovery Day, Psycho. Mm -hmm. A lot now. Yeah. Great. So the awareness is being created. 
And so we've already come up with most of these, I think, seasonal, local, organic. So these are all words, again, if you're a teacher, you can have the kids look up these words and really identify what they mean. Fair trade's another one we didn't talk about. It's also a good one. Um, and so for the next one, you can actually, this link, you can actually look at the impacts of what you like what you're eating has. So you can um, there's a little quiz here. And try to decide which food has more impact on the environment. So we'll just do a couple of questions together. And then again, you can do it later. Or use it in the classroom if you want, if you're a teacher. So the first one, what do you think? So we've got chicken, oh, we can't quite see. There we go. Chicken tikka masala or a lamb curry. Which one do you think has uh, less of an environmental impact? The lower carbon emission. Chicken? Lamb. Oh, a little mix. I heard more chickens. So, the chickens were correct. So lamb is one of the highest <coughs> carbon foods around. And we'll do a couple more. So turkey sandwich or roast beef? Turkey. Turkey, turkey right, for the same reason. So beef, again, is a very high carbon food. And we'll do one more. So tofu stir fry or vegetables stir fry? Which one has less of an impact? Vegetables. That's a hard one. <laughs> okay. So here's some vegetables. Anything else? Vegetable? Okay. Yes. Vegetable is correct. So again, tofu actually is very processed, and so it does have quite a high environmental impact because of that. So there's uh, some more here, diet tips, etc. So this is just uh, something that can help you eat a little bit more. And that's it. So uh, I think I've already gone over this, but this is just designed to help students be aware of this issue and to help them make changes in their diet and in their lifestyle, which will lead to a better future. Um, yeah, and again, urban farmers. Find an urban farmer near you or you know, be involved in creating an urban farm either in your school or somewhere close to you. It will make a difference. Okay, and just to wrap up, um, so we would like to thank the speakers of today, so Jack Alam and Edmund Price Miley Planet for sharing their knowledge, uh, expertise, and their specialized fields. Um, also, thank you for all coming today and giving up your Saturday. I know it's hard, I want to sleep in, but you're doing it for the environment and also as educators caring for your students. Um, now for a short wrap up on our purpose of the workshop. Okay, so I'll take one minute, two minutes. Okay, so about nine weeks ago in our Masters of Educational Studies course, uh, our professor, Dr. Chad Likens, had asked us to take on a challenge project. So our group was formed quite quickly because of our passion for the environment, for health, art, and education. For the challenge project, we were given the mission to create an innovative business or organization to tackle a problem in today's education. We found after studying our topic that the main current issue in Hong Kong is the lack of connection with the environment and with individuals. We believe that through teaching students about the environment, ideally through the authentic use of green groups and schools, that students will not only learn about environmental issues, but care about the changes that we need to make Hong Kong green, greener and make improvements in the city. This workshop serves as a kickstart to creating a community for those with the same interests. So I know that we were discussing earlier, we're very impressed with you know, the different backgrounds and professionals that were brought here today because of this workshop. Um, I don't know if you were able to meet one another and see that there's many different um, professionals here. So we're curious to find out if you would be interested in an environmental and art education online community. And we would be creating that website for you to use to share resources, to collaborate, to know about upcoming events and workshops. Um, and so we hope that you'll just take a few minutes of your time now to provide us with feedback through our questionnaire. Uh, this is very important for our class so that we can further our research and our green initiatives. So thank you so much for coming and have a lovely day.